So I wanted to talk for a few minutes about bait fish and their importance in an aquatic environment when going for different species of fish in angling. They are pretty much the apex point in figuring out how to catch any particular species of fish. And I say that with very wide grain of salt because where I typically fish uh, that's not a regular lake, it's a local pond, but it is absolutely loaded with pike minnows, bluegills, and shad. Threadfin and gizzard, both. Uh, there are no roach in there, roach shad, but there are gizzards. And you know, they are, there are differences in those. Um, but they get anywhere from the little half inch all the way up to six for the threadfin. I've caught a couple of the gizzards close to shore. It's fairly rare. Uh, the ones that I caught were like seven to nine inches. So these these bass in this particular pond, uh, the Rio Grande cichlids in this pond, the flathead and the channel catfish in this pond, the bluegill in this pond, all eat each other and the shad and the minnows. And they're, they're carnivorous as all get out. The thing to keep in mind, oh, and tilapia as well. There's three different kinds of tilapia in there. Uh, Niles, the Nile uh, deep green ones, the really big white ones, and the more silvery banded ones. They know that there are three distinct species of tilapia. They're not the same. Anyway, what I do, and the reason I do it is I take a cast net. Um, I have now a joy fish from Lee Fisher in a quarter inch mesh, four foot, uh, 25 foot hand line. I have another 15 foot hand line I could crimp to it, but I don't cast that far. Because in this pond, literally, I can cast three foot from shore and get like 50 shad in my net. Now, placement's a very important thing when they cast net. You have to look at your depth finder if you have one on your boat. Because if you see a bait ball and you throw off the back where the transponder is, you're going to catch the edge or the whole group. And you can pull hundreds of shad up at a time or whatever the bait fish happens to be, whether it's mullet, herring, whatever you use. You can do that. I typically get 20 to 40, depending on where I cast, and it's a mix of uh, baby bluegill and tilapia and the pike minnows and glass minnows and uh, shad. So yesterday, I went and uh, I do a search. I do a cast here and there to see what kind of bait's going on. If I only get two or three, I'll just dump them back out if I don't want to put them in the bucket. If they're anywhere from an inch to three in a bluegill, I'll keep them because the bass obliterate them when you put them on a bobber. I mean, you just peep the snot out of them. But I cast further uh, in a further spot than normal. <coughs> Excuse me. And I ended up getting six inches. Uh, and they were healthy. It's another thing with with water and shad. If they're too hot, if they're in too warm a water, their flesh starts to get soft. Now, bass don't mind that. It makes it easier to crunch down on them, but it's really bad for putting on a hook. Even if you go under the dorsal and under the, the spine so that you don't paralyze them, it's so soft that if half the time if you throw with any kind of authority at all to get it out to a certain point you want, you can throw them off the hook. These were nice and tough, and the bass are still hardcore enough with the way that they bite that they can still chomp through them. So it's not like it's the most difficult thing in the world for a bass to do. So, it, it any body of water that you go to, whether you have one of those eye cast bobbers, any variety of those castable bobbers, or the remote control boat type uh, transponders. I've actually seen somebody take an RC boat, a big one, and put an actual uh, um, eye bobber under the hole 
of this boat and move it around to see what's in the lake and have it on the, uh, the phone uh, Android. It works. I'm not going to spend that kind of money. I can take my slip bobber. I can pull it, find out where the bottom is. I typically fish near the bottom even with bait because the bigger fish in a, any typical body of water that is a pond are going to be toward the bottom. The bass in this lake, they move around, but the bigger ones are on the bottom. So in the last like four or five months, uh, I've gotten one, eight, uh, ten, and, or ten and a half, and an eleven and a half. The biggest I've seen largemouth wise come out of there was 14 pounds even. It was pretty fucking massive. Um, but there's a lot of structure in this pond, and it's all from when they formed it. So, it's, uh, it's in Chandler here in Arizona. It's way south Chandler in uh, Ocotillo. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, I was fishing these canals. Well, what they did is they expanded the canals and spots and made them into ponds. So I hadn't been back there in years. And I went up on a whim one day. I put on my maps and put on the Explore and let it free. And all of a sudden I see all these bodies of water. Now, the important thing to realize about Chandler is in most communities, even if it's HOA, okay, if you're on a business front on the street, typically any variety of of HOA or PD authorities are not going to give you a bother despite what the signs say around you I've had talks with Chandler PD before because I really love Chandler's waters so I stay on the business uh, side of things typically any pond that I find if the parking lot's in the business and it's a pond right there I'll park and I'll fish if somebody asks me to leave no problem, I'll leave. Because there's plenty of bodies of water in the valley to fish. Just so happens the one I fish is one of the most prolific. So, it has a ton of structure. It has these big dips that go down to like 15 feet. And then they even out at like 7 on the flats. And it's just a phenomenal place. And it's indicative of about 70% of the different types of bodies in bodies of water structure-wise. The only thing it really doesn't have in it is trees and such. Hey, no problem. What you have is good enough. So, it's important to know what type of bait fish are in there. That's one of the reasons I started carrying a cast net. So they could cast it, see what was in there, close to shore, to at least get a picture of what's in the water. Okay, Even if I'm on a boat and it's a new body of water, or I haven't been to that body of water in some time, I'll cast a net, let it go down, pull it up, and if I get bait fish, I'll know what's in there, okay? Another thing that cast net does for me is I'll sometimes catch predatory fish, i.e. bass, big gills, tilapia, cichlids, catfish, in the net. Now, it's really not that good for the net. However, when they're right there where I'm catching bay fish, that lets me know they're active. And that's also important. The other thing, if you ever just cracked your neck and it felt really good, wow, that was amazing. Okay, anyway. So, you go to a new body of water. Never fished it before in your life. A couple things that you can do. Ask the locals. Muy, muy importante. Ask the locals because they know they have experience especially the old timers they know all the shit about a lake you go to the marina and say hey i'm new here do you have any pointers i would like to get on the water and get uh, catching fish fairly soon and with minimal time on the water most marina people will know what the locals know or can ask for you in today's day and age with cellular technology especially with people with Verizon because you can be at the bottom of a fucking mountain with Verizon in half service it's just it really is that good they just cost too fucking much that's why I got rid of them but if you're on the lake they can give you an update if you ask for it and they will most of them will 
if they hear something, they will call you or text you and say, hey, I heard this. Some of them not. Some locals are kind of really closed mouthed, but a lot of locals are really cool. <clears throat> Here in Arizona and in California and Texas, the main southern uh, states for water, uh, Utah, Nevada, not so much because they're kind of uh, highfalutin type people uh, that I've met anyway. But California Delta, uh, Arizona, big reservoirs. Texas has big water all over the fucking place, okay? Florida Everglades, Okeechobee, the other ones. These people know, these locals know really well what's going on. And a lot of them are very willing to help you out. So ask the locals, okay? Locals, marina owners, marina employees. Uh, you can also ask kids. Hey, you walk up the shoreline. Hey, guys, what's, uh, what's up with this lake? What's going on? I've done that, and I've got valuable information because kids will not hold stuff back from you. They open their lips and give you everything. Very valuable source of information. Downside, sometimes parents think you're an old creeper when you're really just trying to fucking fish. Uh, in society, people are just too fucking uh, touchy-feely sensitive. You know, they're, they're really stupid to a point. But you're asking for fishing information. I've actually been approached by kids that have been fishing with their parents and their parents don't know anything about fishing, I've ended up giving lessons on how to fish. And that's a di bit of a different situation. But I tell them the same thing. Try to match what type of bait is in the water. And if I find out for them, I'll tell them. And sometimes I'll even look in their tackle box and say, hey, well, this will work because this is matching what's in here. It's all centered around the bait fish, whether it's crawdads, shads, uh, shiners, mullet, herring, you know, you, you name it. Bluegill, chop them in half, throw them out, catfish are going to happen. You know, there's there's a deep connection in the water between all the life that's in it. It's very connected. And the unique thing about bass in, in specifically, yeah, this is why I love bass. They are such apex predators that they know when they're younger that they have to hustle to get food because they're competing. Once they've gotten to a certain size and they know, hey, I can wait till the young ones are done and the dead bait will fall, they hang back. The bigger ones are the ones you just like, ah, okay. They see an easy meal come by them. That's one of the reasons why swim baits that approximate bait just obliterate bass. It's one of the reasons that bluegill baits obliterate bass. And you've got to know the body of water you're going to, what the primary source of their eating is, what they're eating. Now, different bass, even the big ones, will have different diets because they'll have a preference. There's some big bass that will only eat bluegills. There's some that will only eat shad, roach, gizzard, you know. I mean, there's some that will only eat crawfish. There's some that will only eat trout. So you, you really have to be informed before you do that. But I would recommend getting a cast net and just in general, go along the shoreline or if you see a bait ball, catch some, see what they are, use them. Because if you catch them, they're definitely getting eating, eating them in that lake and you're going to catch something. It's really a very imperative thing. Also, if you have lures that approximate a bait that you know is in the water that the fish are eating, Get the appropriate scent. I usually catch the live bait and use the live bait only, so I really don't put scent on mine. The other thing is, when you are in an area where a lot of people are using a specific type or, or vein of bait, of lure for a, a bass or any predatory fish, and they're spraying all of their baits with scent, don't. Because then you're being different. It's one of the only times where being different is going to work to your advantage. Uh, Tim and, uh, I don't remember, uh, Matt and Tim, I think is their name, from Tactical Bassin. They will make statements about what areas to fish, and then they'll say, but in this case, do the exact opposite. Well, the reason for that is because it's 
a difference. You want to do that with live bait and lures. Because then you're approximating the nature of the way that natural baits are working and you increase your chance if you're not using natural bait. But you always want to match your baits to the forges around. And if you can't, then you use things that will approximate pretty much anything like spinner baits, frogs, uh, deep spoons. I, they're legendary. I've actually taken... My dad had a Johnson spoon that was six inches long and weighed like an ounce and a half. I was 15 years old. He said, I'm not using this thing anymore, son. This thing doesn't work. And it was in Dobson Ranch. And that was when we were fishing together quite a bit. And I put a two-foot sectional line past a heavy-duty swivel and put this Johnson spoon on it. And at the time, the only thing I knew was the standard figure eight knot. I didn't know any other knots. And I cast that thing out along the shore, about three, four foot out. Slower on the back. It just sat there doing a wobble, not even the full spin. Just the wobble like this, and I could see it in the water. And I said, Dad, Dad, watch, look. And there was this big flash behind it. Like it had seen it and turned around. Which bass will do. If they see something out of the corner of their eye, they will turn quick. And all of a sudden it was on it. And I had what from Fenwick, uh, I really wish they still made these rods. It was called the Hook Setter Series. It was a crankbait rod, but I used it pretty much for everything with the uh, Abu Garcia bait cast I had. It's a very ugly setup. Man, it pulled some fish in in my time as a teen. It really did. This ain't flashed. It hit it like a ton of bricks. It was so massive that it almost pulled me in. I only had like 10 pound line on. I think it was just standard Berkeley or Trilene. And at the time it was like the big dog on the water for line. I got it like 10 foot from the shore and it popped that spoon off. I don't know if it was the line. I don't know if it was the knot. But it was a really massive disappointment. And I can tell you now from my experience in bass, because I've caught tens of thousands of thousands of bass by now, and a lot of them over five and a fair amount over 8, 10, 12 pounds. I've caught a lot of big bass. This bass was all of 10 pounds. And in Dawson Ranch in Mesa, which you have to have a membership for as an HOA member, that's exceptional. They really don't exist that big in Dobson Ranch. Now lately, I've gone back and thrown a swim bait that's looked like the shad because there are a lot of shad in those lakes and had followers. I have one that's a grenade from uh, Mega Bass that looks like a bluegill. I got two not more than a few days ago that followed after and they were just s just slamming shad around them on Saratoga which is one of the Dobson lakes that's known for bigger fish. They were slamming the shad and the only reason they didn't hammer my bait is because they were just so full that they were just curious. Hey, what's this big thing going on? I've already eaten, basically, but instinctually they like, oh, hey, what's this? I hear rattles. I hear all this water moving. I feel it in my lateral line. And it looks like a bluegill. And they will follow. And I had two of them that were at least seven, eight pounds. These are fish that are just not commonly found in these bodies of water. But when you when you throw something artificial that approximates a bait so well that they can't ignore it, when it pushes a lot of water like that bait and disturbs that lateral line, they pay attention. When you throw live bait, that live bait makes a certain sound when it's in the water, and the bigger it is, the more pay of attention it's going to get. Now, in the pond that I go to, I throw half-inch uh, minnows and get pound-and-a-half, two-pound cichlids and get up to over a pound bluegill every day. Uh, I've even gotten carp, tilapia. All the fish in the body of water, contrary to popular belief, even carp, as vegetarian as they say they are, will eat natural forage. So you're just really well off if you at least have an idea of what's in the water and structure-wise. You're better off even more so if you have a really good cast net. Unfortunately, in the state of Arizona, unless it's on private property or it's allowed by permission, you cannot use above a four, 
uh, four foot long net. Then that's the measurement of tall, not the width. So when you throw a four foot, it's actually an eight foot span, but they parachute down after a certain amount of feet. So you gotta really take those things into account. Perhaps my information will help you. Uh, I hope so, because I've learned a lot. I have fished since I was five. Okay. I've learned more since 2014 on my own with new resources out there than I have in the entire time I've been fishing in my life. And I've been fishing a lot. I've learned way more about the biological reasons that fish do what they do. But my primary focus has been on bass. I love catching all species. Crappie especially, man. You get a two-pound crappie, you're in for a fight. So I like having all that information. Places to go with live bait or with live bait representations. Docks. During the prime summertime, during the fall, spring, eh, wintertime, eh, their winter times are actually not very convenient with docks. But summertime and early fall, oh man, it's it's on. That that water's been that consistent temperature. They've been active for a while. Yeah, it's on pretty good. Um and it, de it really depends on where you are in the States. Because if you go in Washington all year long, it's pretty cold, even when it's during the hot season. So they're used to being up and about uh, the same time other places are. But they're usually denser because of the, the barometric pressure, the density of the water, the density of their bait fish. That It all changes. <clears throat> That's a big thing from region to region as well. So... Uh, Docks are definitely a, a primary source. Boats. Boats are just like docks, but they make even a different type of form because they have those uh, curves underneath them. So they'll line up at different points in the water column along instead of just underneath like a dock. Uh, pontoon boats, if they're sitting stable for a while, are even better because they're like floating docks. Underwater rock piles. Underwater brush piles shoreline trees that are sunk down in the water, stumps that come along off of the shoreline, uh, rocks along the shoreline. Smallmouth are notorious for coming out of rocks on the shoreline and clobbering, like uh, twist tails and such. Just pay attention to what you have on the body of water you're going to, especially if you have a boat with a depth finder that shows things, you're good as gold as long as you pay attention. Uh, even the hardest bite, you can get one or two decent sized fish if you're diligent about where you're going and match the forage. Live bait always works better. Representations work pretty damn good as long as you place them in front of the lips of the fish at the appropriate time. 